am very happy to be joined by a fan favorite, Houston Texans safety number 20, Justin Reed. Thanks for joining, Justin. What's going on, man? What's up, man? I'm happy to be on board with you, uh, be able to talk a little bit. Yeah, thank you so much, man. Super happy to have you on. And yeah, I, I sent you a message, you know, earlier today. Um, I just want to ask again, hope that you're feeling well so far. And I was wondering if you had any symptoms from COVID right now. Yeah, um, the biggest thing is just fatigue. Uh, wake up just a little bit more lethargic and uh, catch my wind. I try and still go out and run a little bit to make sure I keep my conditioning out, but I get winded a little bit quicker than I am accustomed to. Okay. Yeah, so I hope you'll get better soon, man. Hopefully you'll be able to, I know you'll be great again once more, man. I appreciate that. Thank you, man. Yeah, of course. And, you know, I, I'm sure it's a little bit disappointing that for you that you may not be able to play in that in our season finale against the uh, Titans on Sunday, but is there anything that you can do to still try and help that help out the team, even if you're not in person over there, like maybe watching film or maybe giving advice or tips to the other guys out there? Yeah, so I still participate in all the meetings, um, okay. just in case I do end up out there. Um, but I try and talk to um, the other safeties that's still in the room, Eric Murray, Terrence, um, J.O. unfortunately is having season ending surgery on his wrist. Um, but just the guys in there, just try and give them seeds of knowledge on how I see the game. Uh, Tennessee's a big run team, a big play action team. Um, they like to run those quick in cuts, uh, especially by Antonio Brown. Um, so not Antonio Brown, I'm sorry. Prime <laughs> from prime from all the media stuff happening yeah, right now. Uh, AJ Brown. Yeah. Um, so if you can get a good key on it, you might be able to make a, a big splash play on the middle of the field, making a play on the ball. Mm, all right. Yeah, hopefully you guys will be able to get that win. I'll definitely be watching that. And uh, I'm sure it was really special for you to play last week uh, in San Francisco in the Bay Area, back in Levi Stadium. And I, th I heard that you had a lot of family and friends in attendance over there. So um, how, how do you think their presence motivates you to play even better? And maybe does it make you nervous uh, because you want to play to higher expectations in front of them? Uh, man, let me first say that it was a blast going back to the Bay. Um, yeah. I watched my brother there ever since I went to school in Stanford. Um, I'd go play on Saturday and then go watch him play on Sunday in Levi mm -hmm. Stadium. So it was a real cool experience to be on the other side of it from being in the stands um, to actually being on the field and playing against those guys. So I was very familiar with Coach Shanahan and his offensive philosophy, especially with having a mobile quarterback. Um, so I made sure to key in on those boots and stuff. But I had about 12 people come to the game. A okay. um, whole bunch more people I still got to uh, that I know that still live in the area. So it was a good feeling knowing that um, I'm right there back in my old stomping grounds from college. And I want to go out and put up a good performance for those guys and everybody watching. Yeah, of course, man. You definitely had some plays out there. It was a lot of fun watching you play. And was there a play on Sunday against the Niners that kind of really stood out to you where you either played like really well or where there was a kind of like a mistake that you guys might have had? Yeah, so um, so I'll give you one of each. So one, my favorite series was early in the first quarter um, okay. where they had the quarterback read around the edge. Um, that was, a, that was a, a big contact play followed by the third down stop on third and second between E. Murray and myself followed by the fourth down stop um, that Jacob Martin got a head start on and then I got the finish off. Uh, that was probably my favorite series from the game. Um, one of the plays, one of the following series that's on the other side of the fence that, you know what I mean, still gets under my skin just from the way, from an officiating standpoint, how it was yeah. called, mm -hmm. was the fumble yeah, um, that they fumbled it back to us, but right. then they called the play dead on four progress. The very next play, they called a PI penalty yeah. 50 yards down the field, you know what I mean? And then yeah. once they scored, um, we took a shot down to Brandon Cooks and they wanted to call us for holding, but they didn't call the PI back on Brandon Cooks. Yeah. Which is like the same contact. So that, that series got under my skin a little bit on, on how that all shook down. I feel like it stole the momentum away that we created, um, all mm -hmm. throughout that game. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I saw that. I mean, that was a little bit, uh, I was kind of disappointed with that, but you know, sometimes yeah. it's you out can't of help control. It. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I mean, your brother, Eric, he played for the Niners too. 
and from 2013 to 2018 and for the Carolina Panthers in 2019. And I also liked watching him play too. And, and you said you were in the stands watching him play. And I'm sure some of it but may have been in Candlestick. Was it in Candlestick too? Yeah, so he played his first season in Candlestick. Okay. Um, but I was still in high school at that point in time, okay. so I didn't get to see it. Um, I think the last season of Candlestick was 2014, and I went to Stanford in 2015, okay. and that's when they opened up Levi Stadium. Yeah, so being in Levi Stadium, I'm sure you were there before multiple times with Eric, but uh, um, did it help you, like, kind of being on the same stadium um, in the game on Sunday, like, kind of feeling the environment from before, having experience in that? Absolutely. There's a certain comfort that comes along with that, um, being in the same stadium that I've already spent so much time in. Um, I knew a bunch of the players on their team still from when I used to go in the locker room when my brother still played there. A um, bunch of guys want to say, uh, say what's up to them yeah. um, that I pass a message along for, but definitely very comfortable. I know that stadium inside and out from the 501 club. Um, to downstairs to even what their locker room looks like and and uh, all the all the the crowd celebrations that they do how um, many time that yeah. their team made a play yeah so what are some things that uh, Eric may have taught you that kind of really stood out to you something that you always remember on a daily basis I mean because both of you uh, play the same position right free safety mm -hmm. okay. play the same position yeah well one of the things I picked up from him he's actually a little bit bigger than me he has about 10 pounds on me Okay. Um, was always be the aggressor. Okay. You know what I mean? Like the game, you actually play the game more safely if you're being more aggressive and playing faster. Because you're playing faster, you're a harder target to hit. You're usually okay. doing the initiation of the contact instead of receiving the contact. Okay. So by being a more physical and aggressive player, but still playing with proper fundamentals and technique when it comes to form tackling, there's a high likelihood that you're going to end up being healthier throughout the season. Yeah, right. So maybe now sometimes you just lose those battles because like I'm about 205 pounds. I'm hitting guys that's 260 pounds. So, yeah. you know what I mean? Noon's yeah. laws come into effect there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So maybe why don't you tell us uh, maybe uh, the major differences between free safety and strong safety that, that you think are important? Yeah, so free safety is all about playing in space. Um, it's a, you get the, uh, uh, a bird's eye view of everything that's happening with the offense um, as far as the formation. Um, you alerting everybody on tendencies that you might notice from the formation that an offense aligns in, what's about to come next. You're really looking for anything that might go wrong in single high coverages. Somebody gets picked off um, as far as like they get rubbed off, if they're running a route. Um, route combinations that are just weaknesses. And of course, if something squeezes through on a run, you got a little bit more feel. Um, your reads are a lot faster since you're closer to the line of scrimmage. So it's all about reaction time. It's about zoning in more on your specific key, which a lot of times is a tight end, um, which is the tight end, the running back and the quarterback. We call that the triangle. Mm -hmm. um, is a lot of times that triangle is what you're reading, whereas a free safety, you're reading more of the whole picture. Okay, right. That that's really nice, Justin. I appreciate you telling us that, man. And of course. I yeah, I wanted to ask you this straight up, man. I mean, you don't have to answer it if you don't want to. You may not even have the answer right now, but I, I just wanted to ask. I mean, I saw your post on Instagram. Um, you know, are you leaving the Houston Texans during the offseason? Um I don't want to leave the Houston Texans. I love Houston. I love the fans here, I love the community. Um I built some roots here to be replaced. Um, but the NFL is a business, and those conversations haven't started yet. They might start once the season is officially over, but at this point in time, those conversations haven't started yet between my representation and Houston, Texas. So there is a possibility um, that I will be moving on. We don't know yet. Those conversations are going to be had in the next coming weeks. Um, but at that point, it just is what it is. Yeah, man. I mean, we all love you down here in Houston for sure. And uh, we'd love to have you down here for a longer time, man. And uh, I appreciate that. Yeah, well, of course. My agent and the Houston Texans are going to be talking about it. So if we're able to come to an agreement where all parties are happy, then it'll happen. And if not, then unfortunately, I'll move on. But one thing is for certain, I'll always keep a home here in Houston because um, Houston is home to me now. 
Yeah, that's really nice, man, of you. And, uh, you know, whether you choose to move on or not, I mean, we'll respect your decision and uh, I hope you, uh, for, for, uh, the best for your future, wherever that might be. Yeah, I appreciate you, my guy. And you did yeah. an incredible job, man. I liked how prepared you were um, handling all this. I think you got a future in uh, either broadcasting, sports casting, all of that. Oh, yeah, I'm actually not done yet. I mean, do you mind if I ask a couple more questions? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, come on, let's do it. Yeah, so I noticed over the years that, uh, my personal opinion, you've been really good at stopping two-point conversions. And I remember uh, that game-winning stop you had against the Jaguars in 2019. And we won that game 13-12 to 12, where you stopped Leonard Fournette. And then you had a great play against the Chargers uh, with a two-point stop. So how do you kind of read those plays really well? And what would you say is kind of the key to try and stop those plays? Yeah, um, you know, I actually started trying to think about a trademark name for because of all those goal line stops and stuff. I don't yeah. know. Go, I've been trying to spin it around like goal line guardian or something. Yeah, I don't know. I'll, cool. figure, I'll figure it out. But um, really, the biggest thing that comes down to is one, taking care of your responsibility first, um, whether that's man coverage. And both of those play calls um, were actually in a man coverage. So when the zone happened, I was responsible for somebody else like either the tight end or in this case with the chargers, the motion guy that came over. Um, but once I seen that it was a run play, um, there's not going to be a flea flicker on, you know I mean? The five yard line or anything yeah, like that. So at that point, when you see the guy who has the ball, you just got to go get him. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? There's a line that he just has to cross um, and you stop him from getting to that line. So you get the low man wins, you get as low as mm -hmm. possible, dig your feet in and, uh, make a stand and you know I was fortunate to be able to come on top of that the last couple of times yeah man those are great plays and uh, uh you were born in Louisiana your brother Eric went to LSU so mm -hmm. uh, what was your decision to go to Stanford and what kind of really stood out to you about well, Stanford whether that was the program or something yeah like that? that was uh I remember that time in my life man it was tough um mm -hmm. LSU offered me late. They didn't offer me until like January when signing day was like February 4th. Mm -hmm. um, I took all type of visits. I went to Oklahoma, Notre Dame, LSU, um, Stanford, and I think Texas Tech. I just took all five of my visits. Okay. Um, but it really came down to Notre Dame, LSU, and Stanford. And what pushed it over the edge for me is a combination of one, um, Coach Aquina, who was formerly at Texas, and he had a resume of guys like Earl Thomas, Kenny Vaccaro, Michael Huff, Sage Griffin, long resumes of DBs um, that he's coached really well. And I've been playing well in the league at that time. And I wanted him to be my coach. Um, my mom was a travel nurse um, at that time. And she actually worked in Oakland across the bay from Stanford. Um, my brother was playing for the 49ers at that time. So I knew he'd teach me about the NFL while I was in college. Yeah. And then, of course, Stanford University itself isn't a bad place to, you know, network and make some lifelong connections like I did make. So the combination of all those things added up together just made it uh, a decision that I couldn't pass up to go on out to Silicon Valley over there. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense, man. And, uh, I, you know, there have been times here uh, when you've been on the Texans where you have to battle through adversity uh, with injuries. And I remember uh, when you had that torn labrum, you, I mean, you played through that for quite a, quite some time. I mean, how do you keep motivating yourself uh, and what keeps you going um well it's easy whenever it's easy when you love it you know what I mean yeah. like I love football like football this is the greatest job in the world I get to go out and play a game I've been playing my whole life joke around with my friends in the locker room in our free time and then just go out and play a sport that I love to play um also keeps me you know in shape all year long so um I do it because I want to be be out there for my teammates I want to be out there for the community and for the fans and you know I mean if I know that even if I might have something lingering which everybody does it's National Football League everyone's going to be dealing with something yeah. um, if I feel like I can still make a positive impact on the team to help us win the game um, I want to be that guy to to go out there and do that and I feel firmly in leading by example and and being out there with your teammates um, with their you know blood sweat and tears and putting your all out on the field. Yeah, man, of course, you you know, you're doing a great job. And uh, do you think that within this organization that um, there, you know, good, healthy relationships are being formed from the management, I mean, to the staff and coaches? I mean, do you think that the communication is there whenever you need to get something across? 
Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, diff, there's different aspects of it. So you have the, the, the coach side of it, whenever you have clear communication, which Lovey Smith has been one of my favorite defensive coordinators because he actually takes our input in on things that we want to do in the secondary and on the back end and uh, how that adjusts to his scheme and his plan going into the game plan for whichever opponent that we're playing for. So that's nice that there is an open line of communication there that we're able to go out and put our best foot forward um, coaches and players to go and play. Um, and then also the community team with the Houston Texans is second to none the impact team with Morgan, Omar, Everett, these guys do a phenomenal job. Um, just always being there to help, especially when I want to get out in the community and, and do something cool. They always make a, always make a way to make it 10 times better. So I want to give a shout out to those guys for the incredible job they're doing too. Yeah, of course, man. And I know you said you wanted to be a kicker for the NFL someday. And yeah. Uh, you actually I am dead as serious about that yeah. too. I'm not kidding. Like oh, I want to play safety. Um, my goal is at least 12, 13 years. Um, I want to tack on another four or five. I want to keep yeah. my leg loose and flexible uh, being a kicker because like I truly know and believe that I can do that. Oh yeah. I mean, you kicked against the Bucks in the preseason and uh, I mean, did you ever kind of play this position before, like maybe in high school, like practice or anything? Yeah. Yeah. I, I was my high school team's kicker. Oh. Um, I made a 50 yard field goal in one of the playoff oh. games. I remember my senior year. Um, but yeah, I did kickoffs uh and field goals wow i mean that that's pretty impressive man i oh. tried to get one in college too man my special teams coach coach alamore didn't let me pull the trigger on oh, it man. so um i'm still trying to get that field goal done in the nfl yeah man I, I hope you'll see that man i'd love to watch you kick and uh i mean so my last question here for you is that you're the houston texans nominee for the walter Payton man of the year and I know you've done great things in this community, especially in Houston. Like I saw that you helped uh, families during Thanksgiving and you helped your home state in Louisiana with a drive to help the Hurricane Ida victims. And for that effort, you won the NFL's Players Association Community MVP. So maybe tell us a little bit about your foundation and maybe some of the work you've done recently and what you plan to do uh, for the future. Yeah, so the foundation's name is Jay Reed Indeed. Um, well, the foundation primarily focuses on everything is kid related because I believe firmly in helping the next generation be equipped for the future as best as they could. Um, and where that stems from is one, my parents um, and also good role models that I've had growing up. I didn't get to where I am without the help of, you know, people that I looked up to, me modeling myself after them, them passing out information and helping me out. If you hear some squeaking in the background, I'm sorry, that's my puppy. He's playing with <laughs> okay. his toys. Um, so I want to pass that along as a tribute to them by passing it on to the next generation. Um, so I love working with Kids Meals Houston, working to end childhood hunger in the Houston area, always doing stuff with them. I love working with candle lighters, um, which helps kids and their families um, with just the obstacles and hurdles of dealing with cancer, you know, um, with medical bills, all the other expenses. I mean, even like parking for the hospital, like all those things uh -huh. add up. Yeah. Um, J. Reed indeed prom focuses primarily on bringing tech into the situation. Um, whenever I was growing up in Louisiana, I wasn't super techie, you know what I mean? Um, I loved math, but wasn't super techie. Just, it wasn't what was around my high school. But then I went to Stanford in the middle of Silicon Valley and I found a love for, numbers and technology so i just want to help that next kid find his passion if it is in um industrial engineering or encoding or anything like that yeah. and i just love to bring tech into the situation and equip students um with tools and resources uh, to give them the best chance of success so what we're planning on doing is we're going to officially launch the 501c3 status this upcoming year in 2022 um, and we're going to use it as a vehicle to start creating tech zones in schools. We've already done some remodeling um, with some local schools uh, with the athletic programs. Um, but what I really am looking forward to doing is building like computer labs and giving like centers where kids can go um, take care of their homework, um, take um, classes in coding or Excel and things like that and uh, just help the next generation grow. Yeah, I mean, that, that's really amazing work that you're doing, Justin, and I wish you the best for that. And I actually have a request for you. Think you can give me a follow on Twitter? Absolutely, man. I can do that. Yeah, of course. And uh, <laughs> when I come out 
when I come out with this interview, I think you can uh, give it a retweet on your end. I absolutely will, bro. All right. I mean, Justin, I want to thank you for taking time out to do this. It was, you know, really great talking to you. Super happy to have you on and I wish you the best for your future. Um, and uh, we'll support you in whatever decision you'll make and uh, keep being great on that field, man. I appreciate you, man. Keep doing you. Keep being the awesome guy that you are too, brother. Oh, man, appreciate that, man. Thank you so much. All right. Good night, man. Yeah. <laughs> All right, big dog. See you yeah. later. Yeah, you too.